Hey guys, it is a rainy, stormy day, which means it's the perfect day to talk about Fyodor Dostoevsky's great work, Crime and Punishment. For February, I tackled Crime and Punishment as part of my Year of Dostoevsky challenge, and it was a reread for me. I have read it before. As tends to happen, the second time you read something, you gain more insights and more appreciation for the book, and that's exactly what happened with me reading Crime and Punishment this month. I will say that I think that Crime and Punishment is the perfect place to start if you're just getting into Dostoevsky. If you want to read a book that really shows you what Dostoevsky is all about, but you don't really want to tackle the big, thick Brothers Karamazov. Yeah, I think Crime and Punishment is the perfect Dostoevsky starter book. It's not short, but it's not nearly as long as the Brothers Karamazov, and it has all the fundamental characteristics of a Dostoevsky novel. You have a character who is alienated from society and on the lower escalons of society. Do you hear that thunder? He's poor. He doesn't belong to the wealthy majority, but he is a member of the minority. And Crime and Punishment is a linear story that centers around one main character, Raskolnikov, the troubled young man who commits the crime. A lot of Dostoevsky's novels have various characters who the story kind of centers around, but I find that Crime and Punishment is one of Dostoevsky's most linear stories, and that it's really about Raskolnikov, and it's really focusing on what's in his head. And yes, there are many complementary characters. You have his sister, Dunya, you have Sonya, you have his friend, Razumkin, and various others, his mother, Katerina Ivanovna. But ultimately, this story is about one man, Raskolnikov. Also, like most of Dostoevsky's work, Crime and Punishment is very psychological. It very much centers on the darker elements of human nature, but it also shows glimpses of light and true religion. In my head, that is what Dostoevsky is all about. He shows the darkest, most sinister sides of humanity. His works demonstrate great pain, great trouble, despair, but they also offer a way out of that, and they also show what human life can be if we have faith in God, if if we recognize the meaning in our lives. You know, there's this great contrast between darkness and light in all of Dostoevsky's works, and especially so in Crime and Punishment. You have Raskolnikov representing the dark side, and then you have Sonia representing the light side, and the connection of these two characters is very interesting. For that alone, I would highly recommend reading Crime and Punishment. As always, I say I'm going to talk about the plot a little bit, trying not to give too many spoilers, but there will be spoilers. There just will be. So if you haven't read Crime and Punishment yet, maybe do so before you finish this video or keep watching. So essentially, Crime and Punishment is about a man, I already introduced him, Raskolnikov, who commits a great crime because he believes that it's in the best interest of humanity. He thinks that this crime, though so grotesque, is for the greater good and therefore it's justified and he can do it and he can evade the natural and judicial laws and commit this crime. Essentially, Raskolnikov murders a woman, a wretched old woman, who he believes that the world will be better off without. And based on the picture that Dostoevsky gives us readers of this woman, it's, it's kind of easy to see his reasoning and to agree, like, yeah, this woman is a terrible person. She's hoarding wealth and taking advantage of the poor. Maybe society would be better off without her. That is Raskolnikov's line of reasoning, and so he murders her with an axe in her home. And then when her younger sister shows up, he murders her as well to cover up his crime. So this double murder takes place fairly close to the beginning of the book. It's definitely not the climax of the novel. And Raskolnikov actually plans to do good with the money that he steals from this dead woman. He's planning on using it to continue his own education, which he thinks will eventually put him in a position where he can benefit society. He has all these ideas of how he's going to use this money to help out the poor. And the weird thing is, he actually does. Raskolnikov is a very generous man. Anytime he receives money, he's very, very poor, but once in a while his mother will send him money, and he ends up giving it away to people that he feels compassion to. And so you see this really compassionate, good side of Raskolnikov, where he feels like he needs to take care of people, and he has some kind of love for humanity. But at the same time, he commits this grotesque murder of two women. Very confusing. Very interesting. So essentially, Crime and Punishment is kind of a classic example of the ends justify the means. This is the scenario where Skolnikov believes that his ends justify his actions. He convinces himself that good will come out of this crime, and therefore it is justified. However, 
The majority of the book chronicles Raskolnikov's deep anxiety, fear, paranoia, guilt, despair, just his inner psychology as he deals with the fact that he has committed this crime and that he's keeping it a secret from everyone. The people in his life can sense that something is wrong with him, that something has changed, but they can't put their finger on it and Raskolnikov, of course, won't tell them. He's not going to admit that he committed this crime that everyone knows about and that the police are trying to find the culprit and it's him, but he keeps quiet. But then he has to deal by himself with this psychological torment that he never expected to feel after this crime. After all, it was just, wasn't it? He got rid of this wretched louse of a woman and yet a deep, deep feeling of guilt sinks in and it just drives him mad. Raskolnikov's inner world is the heart of the story. The majority of the book is spent examining how he feels and how he reacts and how he deals with the world after committing his crime and how he pushes out all the people in his lives and he's angry and he's bitter and he's a terrible person essentially and he is cruel to his mother and his sister and his friends who just love him and want to take care of him and it's all because of what he's dealing with in terms of his crime inside. So although Raskolnikov doesn't face legal punishment until the end of the book, I think Dostoevsky is trying to say that the guilt and the mental anguish that he suffers as a result of his guilt was the punishment for his crime. Psychological torment is an insane punishment. When Raskolnikov eventually confesses, he's sentenced to eight years of hard labor in Siberia, and Dostoevsky barely talks about that period of his life because in a way it's unimportant. That physical punishment was almost a relief to Raskolnikov because finally he was set free because the truth was out, he had committed this crime. Only then could he work through his guilt and forgive himself and be forgiven by others and be redeemed from this crime. Only after the psychological torment of keeping it to himself and dealing with it on his own was gone did he find freedom. And that physical punishment gave him that freedom. He could just work and in a sense pay off his crime and that was so much better for him than the psychological torment. If that wasn't clear, I'm sorry. It's complex and sometimes I'm not very articulate. So read the book for yourself if you want to see the difference between his psychological punishment and his physical punishment. That kind of sums up the plot and I don't really want to give away all the details about the characters. I think all the characters in this book are very interesting and there's kind of some subplots alongside what I've just described about Raskolnikov. So read the book for yourself. Highly, highly encourage you to do that. But I do have some thoughts and takeaways from Crime and Punishment that I would like to share with you guys today. Again, I really love how Dostoevsky does such a good job of portraying people as they really are. Broken, with tendency to evil, selfish, but also capable of recognizing and seeking the good. Wow, that thunder is really something. It's February, we usually don't get thunderstorms. Kind of weird. Like I said, Raskolnikov is an excellent example of this. He's capable of committing a grotesque crime, of double murder, and yet he has compassion for the weak and the vulnerable and the poor in society. He takes care of a widow and her family after her husband dies. He pays for the funeral expenses. He loves Sonia, that dead man's daughter who is a prostitute and is looked down on by most people, but Raskolnikov feels a connection to her and has compassion on her and seeks a friendship with her. Sonia is almost the opposite of Raskolnikov in that she has comprehended and grasped the good much, much before he has. She is a prostitute, and in that sense she is a sinner, but she also has a deeply held faith. She has deep convictions about God and life and forgiveness. She forgives Raskolnikov, loves him, follows him to the ends of the earth. She is, in a sense, his prize after going through the psychological torment and the physical punishment, after paying off his debts in a way she is there waiting for him with open arms, with forgiveness. In that sense, she is kind of a Christ figure, a, Christ, a Christ type. I also think Crime and Punishment is an excellent critique of the nihilistic worldview that many held in Dostoevsky's day, but many people also hold in our day. This worldview holds that moral decisions should be based on the greatest happiness of the largest number of people. It's very utilitarian, and that worldview is what drives Raskolnikov to commit his crime. It's what justifies his crime to him. That worldview falls apart when you look at Raskolnikov's guilt and mental torment that he feels afterwards. Even though rationally he had rationalized it all and convinced himself that he had no reason to feel guilty, he still did. So where is that moral sense coming from? 
In the end, his own conscience works against him. This novel also protests against the idea of the Superman, who believes himself above the rules that the rest of society must follow. There is a deep pride involved here, and Raskolnikov has that pride. He refuses to be like the rest of mediocre humanity. He thinks he's above them. He thinks he's above the law. He thinks that he's in a position to rewrite the moral code and to take actions that other people shouldn't take. And I think that all of us do this to some extent, though hopefully not in the same way that Raskolnikov does. But I think all of us, if we really examine ourselves, we can think of instances where we've thought ourselves above the rules. You know, we've been hypocrites, we've held other people to certain standards, and then we've transgressed those standards ourselves, maybe in private so nobody has ever known about it, and yet we have. We can't write our own moral code and expect not to face repercussions in the depth of our consciousness and in the world around us with the people around us. We just can't. There will be effects. And this shows the importance of an objective, universal moral ethic, moral code. If we can all decide these things for ourselves, then people around us will suffer, the world will fall apart, society will be chaotic. There has to be some standard that we all adhere to. And again, Dostoevsky was a Christian, and I think what he's pointing to here is that there is a universal objective moral code transcribed in the Bible, set by God, that all of us are aware of whether we want to be or not. We might think we can transcend that, like Raskolnikov did, I'm just going to do what I think is best. But in the end, our consciences show us that, that we are in the wrong for doing that and that we should follow the greater ethic that has been set before us and that it's, it's good to fall in line with that ethic and that is what's going to promote peace and goodness and order in the world. So those are my thoughts on crime and punishment, guys. Um, I could say so much more because there is so much in this book, but I just don't have the time and I'm sure you guys don't want an hour-long video. So I highly recommend that you read this for yourself, that you come up with your own conclusions and takeaways from this book, and that you share them with me on this video. Please like and comment, tell me what you think of my thoughts. So yeah, please share your thoughts about crime and punishment. I'd love to hear them. I'd love to have a discussion about this book. And... Whoa. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I will see you again soon.